All right, so this is what I promised in the abstract. I'm going to talk about the current reality of AI, uh, whether or not the sciences of consciousness and ethics are far enough along that we can predict the consequences of AI, and what scenarios we should worry about and which we should seek to accelerate, which is, I guess, what teachers do, right? <laughs> so, um, so just to get this over quickly, uh, yes. Um, I was like, yeah. Uh, this is the one that's going to take some time. <laughs> But I, I know I have to convince you of all those things. And so, but before I can even convince you of what I'm talking about, we have to have some definitions. And in fact, um, I've heard this whole talk is going to be mostly about definitions. And the first definition is that I'm only going to talk about how I want to use the word for the next two hours. I am not here to have arguments about semantics, about how everybody else uses the word. Right? All I want to do is communicate to you clearly. One of the things that makes me different than a lot of people that talk about AI right now is I am actually a programmer. How many people here are programmers? Yeah, so we think like, you know, I, I hate to, you know, I don't want to be trendy with it, but you know, it's different if you're a maker, right? If you build things and you know what it takes to build things, it gives you a great perspective. And I, I flat, flipped on the first screen, you know, see it on the last screen again. Uh, I have a fantastic group of students I work with at, at Bath. And half of us are working on trying to understand human behavior. So that's what we do. We, because we can do AI, we can build things that helps us understand what's kind of natural intelligence. All right. So anyway, like I said, we're not going to do a lot of semantic debates unless you guys decide to during Q&A. But I think we can do more interesting things. Um, these are the terms I'm going to define uh, in the next 20 or 30 minutes. And then I'll give you my future uh, recommendations. OK. So. Um, when I'm talking about those words, I'm mostly, as I sort of just said, going to use the simplest meaning um, that has computational efficacy, that could actually make something happen. Intelligence is about making something happen. All right, so I'm using a very functionalist definition of intelligence. It's about actually creating action. So I'm going to be stripping down and saying, what is something clear that we can use by that term? That's not to say that there's other things. I don't know if you know this. Soul is one of the words that I am going to define uh, at one point in the talk. But I want to untangle a lot of concepts that previously have been confused by historic correlation. So what makes humans important, what makes us uh, uh, socially responsible, is different. It isn't necessarily the same way for something we build. OK? Are you with me? Am I talking too fast? I, I have a funny accent. Yeah, apologies. OK, you can see <laughs> the, the nodding and shaking heads determined by uh, who is the native speaker. Sorry about that. <laughs> Although, actually, they can't understand. Where is that up beyond Swansea? Gal Gal There's a beautiful beach area, but the Welsh cannot understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what's the country? Uh, where are we? Yeah. Most of what I'm saying today, you're going to think, like, really? This is not what is originally language. But most of this is going to come from scientific literature. I don't have a lot of citations in today's talks, but if you really doubt something that you've never heard of before, um, Go ahead and mail me. <laughs> if you don't want to Google it, mail me, and I'll send it to you. There are a few flat slides that are my own research, and I will make that point. Okay. So if I don't say, by the way, this is something I think, and a lot of people don't agree with it, then a lot of people agree with it. That doesn't mean most people agree with it. That means there's a big chunk of people who really work in AI or really work in uh, evolution or something like this that believes this. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> so those are all the, pro the words I promised to define. Uh, and this is the actual outline in color in the middle. So I'm going to start out talking about the computing and AI concepts. Then I'll talk about the biological and sociological concepts. And then we'll get to the point where we can really talk about the psychological and so philosophical concepts that you probably want to hear about, like ethics and consciousness and things. And then, finally, I'll make some recommendations about futures. All right? Here we go. OK, intelligence. The first, as I said, I'm going to do a very functionalist uh, dis description here. It's the ability to generate appropriate behavior in response to an unpredictable environment. Okay, that's what's different about intelligent animals um, from you know rocks. Okay, rocks if they're rolling down a hill, they kind of respond to the bumps on the hill, but it's it's not that's not generating behavior. Right? <laughs> what can I say? On the other hand, I'm not, I am trying to exclude rocks. I am not trying to exclude plants. A lot of people don't think about it this way. But plants are actually, you know, first of all, this plant here seems to be minding its own business, but actually it's doing phototaxis. It's growing towards light. And if it wasn't getting light, it would drop some leaves off and try harder. But this one is a predator. 
right? And this guy, uh, the, he's one of the people that says plants are actually kind of. Um, he does a fantastic Richard Attenborough. Is it Richard Attenborough? Anyway, the, one of those Attenboroughs about you know, the, the predator stalking and, and attacking its prey there. It's doing that by sense of smell. Okay? So, th there's no central nervous system here. Evolution has hacked up a set of rules so that plants can go towards things like light and stuff that smells like it's food, right? And, and that's what I mean by intelligence, okay? I'm not saying that's all humans are. Humans are a lot more than just that. But that's gonna be this first computational principle that we're gonna start from, and then we're gonna go on and start talking about when do you have to really start thinking about ethics, okay? But this is the first piece. This is the first light over, all right? Okay. So what makes intelligence hard? Even though that sounds, oh gee, even plants can do that. Actually, intelligence is super, super hard. And so we're going to talk about computing and tractability. All the people who don't think of themselves, who don't have, okay, do a different way. Who doesn't have a computer science degree at all? Okay, quite impressive. So quite a lot of you guys are, are programmers, but not computer scientists. Okay, good. So I won't totally bore the audience because there's, I'm going to give you some last. There are lots of computation. There's lots of biology, there's lots of physics. There are also lots of computation. And computing is basically a system of systematically altering the form of information. So it's sort of transforming information. Um, and this is one of the laws. It takes time, it takes energy, and it takes space. You have to have somewhere to store it, right? We computer scientists, or even computer programmer geeks, call that memory, all right? But you can't just think anything if you don't have enough space. People tend to think that because computer science came out of math, that's all abstract and magic and eternal and things like that. It's not, right? Computing, making a transformation of information takes these things. So, this is my, my second half of science. <laughs> Why the hard to start? Pretend you bought a robot, um, like maybe a Sony Idol before you went into business or something. It came only doing 100 things uh, it could do, right? So it could turn left, it could turn right, it could eat sleep, right? But it doesn't know what those things do. It just has that stuff built in. And you, the programmer, have to help it um, pick a goal, all right? So like, let's say we want the robot to get stuck here. All right, what does it gotta do? All right, suppose, as I said, you, aren't, you, you can't, I say you can't be bothered, but actually those of you programmers know it would be actually hard to tell the robot exactly Tokyo. So you have a guess. So if getting to Tokyo takes one step, so one of the things that Sony has programmed into the idol is go to Tokyo, if you're lucky, right? <coughs> then in the worst case, it might have to try a hundred different things until it finds the one thing that magically gets it to Tokyo, right? But what if it's two steps, all right? Then it has to try for each of the hundred things, each of the hundred things again, right? Maybe it's turn right and go to Tokyo. Okay, how many possible plans is that? Okay, 10,000. We're already at 10,000 possible plans you might have to try if you're a robust, okay? And of course we know life isn't like that. All right, so, um, yeah, this is the infinite loop a lot of my relatives are stuck in. <laughs> so, um, so uh, when a computer scientist is hard, they mean basically intractable. So there are things that are impossible, like the halting problem. And there's other things that are possible, but would take longer than the universe is old. All right? And we call that hard. <coughs> so it's just one of those technical terms. All right. Tractability. There are apparently more possible short games of chess, not where you just keep moving the rooks back and forth, but like within 35 moves, when there are atoms in the universe. So one of the ways to solve chess is not store in memory a lookup table. Am I making sense? I found out you guys are programmers, so I keep saying, now I'm, I'm treating you like a, a back on the graduate. Sorry about that. Okay. So you can't just have a big giant database that says, oh, of each possible move. That won't work, okay? And, and I got news for you. Does anyone recognize this picture? No? Thomas Crown Affair. Uh, if you ever see it, the original, the original Thomas Crown Affair. Uh, the, the, the next move is not necessarily a chess move, okay? <laughs> so, there's, uh, so tractability is the fundamental challenge of intelligence. That's what, that's what it's trying to overcome, all right? So, 
You can now, so I already gave you one definition of intelligence, but here's another. You can think of intelligence as the search for the next action, the ongoing search, okay? Okay, the side effect. So this is not a definition, this is an anti-definition. Rational cannot mean perfect, optimal, or correct. I don't know why people think, I guess that was, that was our ideal. We had, we had this, maybe we thought God was rational or something. But it can't mean this in the real world, okay? So what people in AI talk about is bounded rationality. And, and people in biology are increasingly understanding that. You have to understand trading off the costs, including the time and space required for computation. Okay? So, there's two ways to speed up thought, right? Which I'm going to talk about in search. And again, this is straight computer science. So those of you who do have computer science degrees, you can be slightly asleep. Uh, the first one I'll talk about, I don't know why I ordered it that way, it's pruning. Okay? Pruning is a way, well, the yeah, active this. You can think about uh, where you are right now as the root of a tree, and then you can think of every act you could take. Remember, pretend you're a robot and you have 100 acts, and you have 100 branches. And then from each of that, those acts, there's a different set of things you can do. Eventually, you get to an actual end point, and you call that a leaf, but it doesn't look very much. But the point about pruning is that there's a bunch of things you're not going to do, like you know, walk in front of the train or something. You say, okay, that involves something. I don't need to go down and look at that search space. So that reduces the number of things you have to think about. <coughs> this is an important point, and it's going to come back when we start talking about robots, okay? You may have wondered, like, why is she using the space of computer science? It all matters. Bodies prune, all right? Evolution has found a set of things that, first of all, it was lucky enough to chance into uh, you being able to, to, you know, getting eyes to work and things like that. But secondly, that tend to work for animals kind of like you. So I, 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 for some reason, I didn't make pictures of bees. The, the typical example is that bees see ultraviolet light and they can figure out things from flowers that they can figure out. But I had picture, cute pictures of otters on the laptop, so. <laughs> they, what they can do is fundamentally different from what we can do. And so therefore, what they can sense is fundamentally different from what we can sense, right? And that's a form of pruning. Same thing for ants. <laughs> These are ants with RFID chips. They don't form that way. They're, they're being very experiment. And the same thing for a baby. A baby does not have all the same capacities you have. It has a lot of the same capacities. But for example, they, they tend to focus just about this far up. There's a theory, this is egocytic, I'm not sure if it's been confirmed, but it's a theory that that helps them focus on the mother's face, because that's about how far away they'll be. So it helps them focus on the stuff they can, they can do at first. They don't have much motor control at first, right? So they have, but they have more reflexes. So babies are different from adult humans, Ants, even adult ants and otters are different from us, right? So that is part of, um, that, is, that means we have a limited number of things we can think about. Okay, so back to the strategy, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been this again. Concurrency, all right? This is another really good way to handle um, uh, searching a whole lot of things. I told you before that you could think of search as a tree. Now, it's not thinking of it as a tree. Think of it as a set of tunnels, like in Scooby-Doo. Do you guys all know Scooby-Doo? <laughs> okay, so you got five people, and you know, lo and behold, depending on the episode, you either have two or three tunnels you have to go down, right? And that determines whether or not Thelma gets to be the shiny in Scooby-Doo, right? <laughs> so so well, that's the way you can search quickly. It's by, you know, but there's this problem. I, I, it keeps happening every episode, and they don't learn, right? <laughs> when you find something down one of the tunnels, how do you let the other ones know? So, so concurrency is great because you can use multiple, you can, you can search a larger space because you're doing it all at once, but it only works if you can communicate the, the solution. All right. Whoops, I meant to build this. <laughs> so um, ignore that part, just think about this part. Let's say that you have a population of uh, 2,000 agents, 2,000 people. This yogurt example? Oops, I didn't say what the example was. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah, making yogurt. That was actually one of the things that helped uh, humans invade Europe, all right? Because uh, we couldn't initially digest milk, and having cows basically gets you through the, the parts where they're, they sort of carry fat around for you. So it's a way of having a refrigerator without electricity, right? You've got fat that stays with you, and you can take it along with you. So, but the problem was you can, well, most mammals can't digest milk after they're about two. Uh, so, but if you make it into yogurt, you can eat it. But how would you discover that? In the Middle East, you got that for free because it just curdles immediately. 
But in Europe, you have to leave the milk sitting there for five days. So who's going to do that, right? Well, if there's a 1% in 1% chance of discovery in a lifetime, and you have a community that, you know, villages weren't 2,000 people, but actually it turns out even in the Amazon with these little tiny villages, over a period of a lifetime, people talk to about 2,000 other people, right? So they, they, have, they went, because uh, this guy, Kim Hill, that has gone out and talked to, and said, the number of people that you've spent a night with, you know, sitting at the campfire exchanging stories, and it came out between one and 2,000 people, right? So now, going back to concurrent search, we can think of two different things. If it happens that it's not just you discovered it during your lifetime, but that you're genetically predisposed to discover it during your lifetime, then it can be passed on to your children, but then the only, the only way to communicate at this point is that then you and your children outcompete everybody else's children. So that can take a very long time. But that's how evolution works, okay? <laughs> Evolution's at four billion years, right? Humans have been uh, around for millions of years, but we've only been totally changing the world for about 10,000 years, all right? About 10,000 years ago, we started writing, we started agriculture, we started building cities, um, we started doctrinal religion, which means evangelizing. And you can think of that as, uh, well, both writing and evangelizing, as communication, right? And so now we are doing massive concurrent search in a way that most evolved uh, systems can't. And so that's why we can change the world way, way faster. All right? Now, I, I just realized I have a slide about this, so I'll just tell you. AI is another way that we can search. And so AI is adding into the system that we've already got for rapidly changing the world, for rapidly finding out about new ways to change, behave. All right? So that's what AI is doing. Right. So I do sort of have this slide. I'm sorry my, 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 my uh, jack is broken, so I'm not going to plug it in. So you, we're not going to listen to the Watson. I, if you've never seen the Watson stuff, go and see it on YouTube. It's amazing. Um, but this is actually totally distracting, so I'm going to turn it down. Um, but you're probably looking at the box of that image thing here. Doesn't this look like two people? Yeah. You know, you can tell it's not because there's, there's not enough room for them, but doesn't look like a pantomime horse. <laughs> well, that's because they've done motion capture on real humans, and that's part of how they got this intelligence, right? And, uh, and, and Watson, I don't know if you know this, but it's like this American program that plays in Amer the American game show that everybody watched on TV. It's like, that's like um, mastermind here. Um, Watson read, right, parsed um, all kinds of online documents, right, Wikipedia. They made the mistake of having it parse uh, uh, the Urban Dictionary, which unfortunately, you know, it informs it by a lot of stuff, but it used the same thing for production, so that was, they had to take that back out. <laughs> right? So anyway, the point is that part of the reason we are succeeding at AI right now Right? And I don't know how people can watch this kind of thing and think, oh yeah, we'll never have AI. You'll get people saying, we have AI, all right? Besides you have it in Google, besides you have it on your iPhone, right? But anyway, we have AI. And part of the reason we have it is because we uh, programmers have learned how to exploit the discoveries of both evolution and culture, all right? And then we're passing it into machines, right? So, and then the other things, of course, as I, I said on the previous slide, cloud computing. So we are just doing a bunch more search on a whole bunch of computers, right? And then sometimes we share the information. Those of you who get really excited about open data um, and open access, this is one of the consequences, massive communication, all right? So that was the first of my bullet points, and I've only defined one of the, oh, two, I got culture too. So two of the terms I promised you, although I also gave you a bunch of other stuff that is pretty useful. Computation, for those who can't see, computation, tractable, rational, pruning, concurrency, concurrency. Some of those things are gonna come back. But let's go on to thinking about biology a little bit. <laughs> you may not have been guessing this was gonna be the first one. <laughs> okay. What is a robot? It's an intelligent machine that's actions um, impact the real world in real time. Okay, that's the difference between just any kind of AI and a robot, right? And are based on sense in the real world, in real time, okay? Okay, so that's a robot, easy. Now you're all thinking, oh, we know this trick. Now you're gonna tell us that plants and people are robots, right? Right, I am not gonna tell you that. The reason that there's different, and I've only recently realized this is a huge confusion people have, just because I've been getting to argue with people a lot. 
The big difference is that we build robots, so we determine the goals. We do the printing. There's certain things you can do when you have a kit that you can, you can raise them and expose them to certain kinds of things. You do expose them to some number of languages, right? So you affect them, but you don't affect whether or not they feel bad when they're, when they're abused, right? You don't affect um, that they want to reproduce. Everything biological wants to, wants to live, it wants to go out and, and, and create, right? So you don't get to change that. But with a robot, we can change everything. All right. We can't you know, we can't deny the laws of physics and we can't deny the laws of computation. Unlike I don't know why some people think that oh we'll just make something that'll live for eternally and it won't be a big deal. We can't define we can't we can't break those kinds of laws. Well otherwise we can we have we have perfect authorship within the constraints of the laws of computation, laws of physics. Right. Okay. So social behavior. Now we're now we're more into biology. Three quick definitions, all right? So cooperating is uh, behaving to the advantage of others, all right? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're being altruistic. There's quite a lot of mutualism when you basically come up to an agreement and you both benefit, right? You do business, all right? But altruism is when you pay a net cost to benefit others, all right? So you can see we're building our way towards ethics, right? <coughs> so can we find altruistic behavior in robots? Oops, sorry about the building. In. <laughs> uh, so I told you the slides wrong. Yes, we can program them to make any cost benefit assessment we choose. All right. Now notice I can't. I didn't say uh, can we make them altruistic. We'll get to that later. But we can get them to perform altruistic behavior. All right. In nature, yes, you also find altruism. And and this is I don't know when you went to school when you had biology, but uh, some you may think that's surprising. Because you think, oh, but didn't Dawkins show that couldn't happen, right? But, um, right, so traits advantageous to community that cost its individual were for some time, you know, for decades, considered an accessible evolution. But it's not true, okay? And again, I can, there's loads and loads of um, work about this. Uh, it, sometimes it's called inclusive fitness, sometimes it's called kin selection, sometimes it's called group selection. And I don't know if you guys keep up with biological debates, but you might be led to think that, oh, because there's like wars between Novak and Sloan Wilson and, what, and uh, Stuart Wilson here at, uh, sorry, to West, West here at Oxford, that, oh, there may be there's some doubt about this. They're, they're haggling over the details. The fact is that this process, which has been shown mathematically to be equivalent, incidentally, all these different things, can get you through it. And I can explain to you really quickly. So what's transmitted in evolution, right? is a replicator. That's the thing that actually reproduces itself. Right? That's, that's the thing that is repeated. Those of you who have children may have noticed your children are not identical clones of you. All right? So the unit of selection is called the vehicle. I think vehicle is the Dawkins term. Interactor is another one. It's the thing that actually gets out and interacts with the environment. Remember robots interacting with the environment? Right? So. These are almost never the same thing, possibly never ever the same thing. I'll show you this in a minute. Right. So yeah, basically in, 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 in the wild, vehicles are not, are made of lots of replicators. Right. And I think I forgot, can I use this, this whiteboard over here? Are there, are there markers somewhere? Are they announced it? Not sure. Yeah, I don't want to write something bad. See, see if you can find the. Okay, maybe I'll risk, the, the maybe I'll risk it. <laughs> let's, do, let's do a small test. <coughs> let's do a small test. Yeah, small test says it doesn't work at all. <laughs> all right, so you just got to. Wave your hands. Yeah, just wave my hands. So, because of this, there, there's something called Hamilton's Law, which was actually figured out in 1964, which says that you will pay a cost as long as the benefit that's accrued by others times how related they are to you is, is greater than that cost, okay? So that's why you do stuff for your kids. They're only 50% related to you, but they, um, but you can, what you do hopefully benefits them more than it costs you, right? So, let's see. So that's, how do you get multiple levels of interaction out of this? 
OK, this is the one case where maybe the replicator is, is actually finding it out on its own. It might be that, that, that genes fight over whether they're near crossover sites, because genes get disrupted. Genes are the things that replicate in biological evolution. Um, they might get disrupted by this. So this is like a crazy theory, which I have no idea whether someone has, has uh, conclusively proved one way or the other. But at least it's a point where a replicator is actually fighting against another replicator, possibly. Right? But when you think of the classic you know, survival of the fittest stuff, there are tons of genes. Right? It's hard to make a deer. Right? And the interesting thing is that actually a lot of the genes that these two deer have are in common. There's not that much uh, between them. And so the idea is that if a group, if it takes a group to, uh, to get a resource, so like here, these animals are probably fighting over who gets access to a carcass, right? So the lion could take out any one of the hyenas, but as a group, the, the lion doesn't fancy its chances of getting through all of them, all right? But why are the hyenas risky that they might be the one that gets killed? Well, these are probably sisters. Right? Hyenas are another one of those things where the females are actually dominant. But Anyway, so uh, why aren't we all nice all the time then, right? <laughs> um, the cooperation is only rational when it increases the probability of replicators persisting. All right, that, that's why I already told you earlier. So sometimes there's only enough food for one monkey or one family or one village. So you wind up competing a lot um, with, you know, locally when you live close to people. But sometimes you need to live close to people because that's what protects you from the next village. Right? So there's a trade-off. Right? So part of what humans are doing all the time is trying to balance that trade-off. You know how it sounds so horrible when you're on a plane and they say, you know, in the event of an emergency, ignore your child, take care of yourself. Right? And then you can help your child. But it won't work the other way around. First you've got to be breathing, or else you can't help your child. Or and the child can't help you at all, right? That's the assumption. So that's, that's, that's life, but the reason it sounds horrible is because ethics, we're, we're, what we think of, what we think when we're doing things explicitly, we will reflexively often do things for ourselves. But when we think explicitly about things, when we use language, we're often thinking within an ethical framework. So here's a definition for ethics. This is behavior that optimizes social living. So they reduce costs from conflict, and they may be more inclined to favor the group because the individual can pretty much be uh, relied to take care of uh, itself because it feels pain and things like that. But that is one of the things from my own research. So that's not necessarily, not everybody thinks that there's a bias in that. OK. So we've gotten a little further. That was what you needed to know about sort of biology. Not much sociology there, actually, but, but social thought. Um, so we've got through cooperation, altruism, ethics, into ethics there, and actually human and robot. So, ah, are you, are you ready? How many goals are you trying? Oh, there's a problem. I'm doing that. All right. So the goal is to try to finish 3.10 maybe, and, and then we'll have 50 minutes of questions. That so, would be fine? Yeah, OK. All right. Oh, yeah, I forgot about those guys at the bottom, right? So just as a quick reminder, because I've been going over a lot of material, um, I'm expecting that by the time I get through this third thing, you're going to be reasonably happy with these two questions, and we can go on and have this conversation. Okay. So here's the third, the third uh, pitch. All right. So first of all, agency. Another set of, uh, of definitions. An agent is something that causes change. Okay. That is a basic definition from philosophy. So there are chemical agents. If you remember that there are some chemicals you throw them in a test tube together, nothing happens. There's some chemicals you throw them together and they react. The thing that makes the reaction happen is called an agent. Okay. So an agent is just something that affects change. But what's interesting is that now we can get into the moral philosophy. All right? A moral agent is something that society considers responsible for its actions. All right? So like little children, if they're young enough, are not considered moral agents. They are not the ones considered responsible for their own actions, even though they generated them themselves. I realized towards the end of this talk that I forgot to define autonomy, but it's hard anyway. But let's say that little children are autonomous, but they aren't considered to be moral agents. Right. So um, let's see. And a moral patient is different. It's something society has responsibility towards. Now, not everybody accepts that it's actually coherent 
to have a separate idea of moral patiency. Some people say you can only be a moral patient if you're a moral agent. And so to the extent that children are, 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 uh, have any uh, ability responsibility towards them, it comes because their parents, the real moral agents, would feel bad if something happened to them. Right. So on the other hand, quite a lot of moral philosophy, recent moral philosophy, the last 30 or 40 years, they treat things like, for example, the environment as a moral patient. Okay, so the, the environment has no idea what's going on. Or, or chimpanzees, okay, chimpanzees can tell if they're in pain, of course, but they don't understand the you know, human society or law or anything, right? But people argue about whether they're moral patients that society has to defend, right? So that's a bunch of concepts, all right? I don't know why that's funny. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, it's my research. Okay, so, so now we're gonna go through a bunch of stuff that's in my papers if you wanna read them. Everything before that was stuff that could, came out of text. Okay, so I think the moral actions require a behavioral context that affords, that allows you to do more than one possible action, all right? And that at least one of those available actions is considered by a society to be more socially beneficial than the other options, all right? The individual has to be able to recognize which action is socially sanctioned and has to be able to act on that information. So if you don't have all of these, these three things, then you're not really talking about a moral act. Right? Notice that it's really easy to build this into robots. Right? You can, you can put these three things in. So you could say that a robot is making a moral action. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the robot is the moral agent. Okay? Because of the stuff we talked about before, about our authorship. All right? Also, I literally uh, made this broadly enough to include some stuff. Do you guys know Franz de Waal? Speaking of TED Talks, right? Franz de Waal has uh, Google, I don't know, Franz de Waal, uh, Angry Monkey or something. <laughs> yeah, he's shown, um, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Or, or yeah, Franz de Waal TED Talk, you'll get it. In Franz de Waal's writing, he talks about the fact that monkeys get very offended if they see things happen that they don't think is correct and they will sanction it. So some of this really old stuff was about um, his very first book, in fact, is that, that once in a while, like a dominant chimpanzee is pounding on a subordinate, and they're really brutal to each other. Um, and it's too violent, and the other chimpanzees start complaining. They just start all making a barking noise and, and sort of sanctioning the, the, the dominant male. But normally they wouldn't want to hassle, but because it's the whole truth, they can do that. So that's saying, we, don't, we think they're going too far. So that's something that even apparently and I, one experience I've had, capuchins have a law that if, if, you, if you're holding something, you own it. And uh, the, uh, so we're taught that if you, I've, I've worked in uh, non-human primate labs. Um, and uh, we're, we're taught that when you go there, like if they grab something, it's theirs and you have to ask for it back. You can't just take it back or there's gonna be trouble. But unfortunately one time what it grabbed was a part of the sweater that was attached to a guest. So the guest of course pulled back and the entire troop started barking at the guest. Again, it's a sanctioning, it's a verbal sanctioning. And interestingly, other troops in the building that couldn't even see what had happened all also started barking. And so the head of the lab came in, and found out what was going on, laughed at us, and, uh, and then turned out the lights. And so the night falls in the jungle. And that was what they all calmed down, the night you don't make noise. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, monkeys can do this. We can build robots to do this. So, we, so I don't think the issue is, can we make robots do moral actions? I think the issue is this displacement of responsibility that I already told you about the authorship thing. All right? So if we're gonna talk about this, whether or not it's appropriate to make a displacement of responsibility, we need to think about both of the societies, well, both, any society invented. So I think we should think about the pros and cons of considering robots to be responsible. If we want to make them moral agents or not. Or do we want robots to be the ethical ones? Right? The other alternative of not having them be agents is considering them basically intelligent for studies. All right? So there are things that can do stuff for us, but, but we're the ones who are the moral agents. We're the actors. We're the ones who have the responsibility. All right. So I think this build will actually work. Yes. OK. Just taking it from the perspective of human society, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you guys can think of better ones. I, I have heard, um, I mean, this I, This is a bit brutal, but it's, it's true. There, I can, again, I can give you a paper 
uh, by somebody who studied artificial life and said that most of the people who really, really want artificial life to, to exist are sort of middle-aged, single uh, males who want to reproduce. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not restricted to males. <laughs> no, it's not entirely. It's not entirely. There are a few. There are there are a few women who feel it very strongly that that there should be uh, there should be um, there, uh, there should be robots should be given ethical uh, rights and responsibilities. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm sure it's a, whoever said that might feel that way. But also, I mean, in print, there's some people who are very strong in this. But it is, there's more males and females saying it. And it's funny when I see on planes, people say, there's people who worry about this. Are they male? <laughs> anyway, by the way, where are we going? Oh, the other thing, I have heard people say, well, you know, if the problem is that the planet is going to blow up in only 4 billion years, and we need to figure out how to get, and we can't go fast than the speed of light, so it's essential that we have self-reproducing spaceships that carry our culture for us. Now, remember that thing I told you before about concurrent search and about re replicators and things? Some people think that we've gone beyond the genetic replicators being that important and that the idea replicators are more important. And so they're just as happy to have the robots carry those things out as us. All right? I'm telling you that because it's another opinion. My own opinion, again, because I do AI, is that uh, that all of our values, everything that we think matters, is rooted in the, what we are, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in being apes. So I'm less sure that that stuff will make sense if we push it off onto machines. But anyway, I, I also, as a, as a technologist, doubt that we're going to build robots that will last four billion years. <laughs> okay. There's never been a species of hominid that's lived more than one and a half million years. Right? And, and technology, most file formats can't be read for five years. Right? So, uh, I, yeah, I, I think a lot of this is not clear thinking, but I could be wrong. And it's really hard to understand because of the incredible uh, uh, rate of, uh, of, of expansion of computation that we have right now, and of culture. I, I think it's very hard to do this right now. Um, but anyway, uh, it's, it's possible that, if, that somehow uh, if we delegated to the robots uh, uh, autonomy, or if we made them more like us, so we, we basically replicated our, 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 our suffering, our, our motivations, all those kinds of things, that, it, that they'd be better tools than if we made them uh, not like us. Okay? That, so we don't know that, that's just what some people argue. Okay? But I think the, the cons are that, um, the, that it's a political and, and commercial moral hazard. So a commercial moral hazard is you tell people, oh, you know, you have to take care of your dog or it's going to die and it's going to suffer. And actually, you know, you could have just changed a little bit of memory and be perfectly happy. Right? It's not like a real dog. Um, and you've already seen people doing this. But again, back to Sony and their iBooks. They actually had an instruction manual this dog learns from you. So if you think it's boring, it's because you haven't trained it well enough. <laughs> <laughs> You've been a bad dog owner. <laughs> right. That is completely unethical. I'm sorry. But, you, know, you cannot. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but part of the reason I, I had noticed when I first started working on humanoid robots in the, in the early 90s that people were just immediately gave them what I now know is called moral patience. That was before I knew all this stuff. I just thought it was weird that people would walk up to me and say, oh wow, a humanoid robot, it's unethical to unplug that. I'm like, well, it's not plugged in. <laughs> well, it would be unethical to unplug it if you plugged it in. I'm like, well, it doesn't work. <laughs> and we were trying to build this robot. It never, well, it, it sort of worked eventually. Anyway. <laughs> but the point was, how could you be so confident of that? And, and now you get people, and uh, some of them are my really good friends. You see this a lot in the philosophy literature, saying about how important it is uh, people I really respect come up to me at conferences and say, how could you be so prejudiced against our future AI offspring? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be prejudiced, but, but anyway, the point is, we are so likely to do this. Oh, I, I heard the point, sorry. That was about the moral hazard part, but part, the, I, I just wrote about that like once every four years because it was kind of a hobby, it wasn't something important. But then in 2007, um, right after you know, Abu Ghraib and the, 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 you know, the invasion of Iraq and all that, people, the American government started funding um, moral robots. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, so what are you trying to do? Are you trying to assign us? I said it's a political 
concern about the misattribution of blame. Are you trying to say that the robot is to blame? And, and this is, I mean, I, have you guys been keeping up with the thing that happened the last week with uh, the UN and autonomous you know, killer robot stuff? On, on the one hand, you know, I do think we really need to think about this technology and where it's going. And actually, one of my big concerns is about how it shifts the cost-benefit analysis. Because Americans pulled out of Vietnam because you know, 30,000 or something had died. And, and I'm sorry, that would be wrong, maybe 300,000. And, and it took a lot longer to pull out of Iraq because only 4,000 died. Right? And the fact that we spent a trillion dollars, voters don't think about that. Right? So, the, um, so I'm worried about it from that perspective. But, but I also don't like to say killer robots because I think, again, it's possible that you, you know, where, when you actually have the autonomy, the extent to which you have autonomy, is, is uh, if you just say how much can you trust the tool to make a decision quickly, correctly, and that would be very carefully determined, right? And so the real thing is how do you control the, the cost benefit decisions that politicians are making? And maybe that's what those guys are trying to do. Maybe they know that it's not, the, that it's not really the terminators, but they're really trying to help voters realize that they don't want politicians to do this. But anyway, I worry a lot about all that. Um, okay, but just in case, because this is future series, some of you might say, what about the robots? Don't we owe it to them that we should let them you know, self-actualize? Okay? Um, I don't think, for, for existing or existed, <coughs> how many people are philosophers here? <coughs> okay, <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a joke out of the right to life. <laughs> Right, so, so there, there is no current robot that would benefit from from the formal agency, right? That's we really know how. To. Um, but I don't think it's it's I don't think it's better for the robots to be competing with humans for resources, the stress of social dominance, suffering, things like that, fear of death. I don't see why those are things that would benefit the robots. Um, but again, this is really arguable, and I'm sure people love arguing about it. <laughs> but this is. I think that, um, well, first of all, yeah, ethical systems co evolve with sociality and are co developed with culture. Um, there is no predetermined slot for AI. It's weird how people say, oh, but this is clearly true, you know? No, it's not clearly true. We're actually talking about two different sets of artifacts. We're both organizing our society. We, we legislate now, right? So a lot of our, of our structure is it's locked. And we're building the robots. And my own opinion is that it doesn't, that it's a bad idea for both humans and for machines to, uh, to uh, make them moral patient, agents or patients. I really think it's better for us to keep the, the responsibility that authorship imposes on us. All right, so, <laughs> again, stuff that this is why I, I think we're ethically obliged to make robots, we are not ethically obliged to. I also think deeming robots to be moral agents unethically neglects our responsibility of authors, uh, our responsibility as authors of their intelligence. Okay? But these are normative assertions, they're not facts. Okay? There's a difference between normative, you know, I can't do science and discover this. Right? I can do science and say what are, gonna, what are the expected consequences to society to going with us or going against that. So science can tell you the probability of things happening. It can help you try to think about, you can build models and try to guess what the future's going to be. But science can tell you what really matters. That's something that's the humanities, right? And that's, that's what society has to come together and figure out. But I'm not, I'm not abrogating my responsibility. I'm just telling I have made recommendations and I would stand by those and argue those as a, as a philosopher. Right? That's a humanities person. All right, so I know part of the reason you guys uh, turn up is <laughs> <laughs> because I promised to talk about uh, consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, sorry, it's a break. I forgot there was a little bit. Is it going to come? There it is, yes. Okay. Oh, the, the baby elephant. What if the robot? Um, Again, I can be totally reductions about this. I didn't think, I'm, I'm doing the case, so I will go ahead and give you a couple slides on consciousness. I have more after the break, so if you want to ask more questions, go ahead. This is completely reductions. Uh, consciousness is a special kind of attention. It's a name for the feeling you have as you evaluate chains of actions with intermediate outcomes. So basically, when you're trying to create a new plan. All right? Now, remember what I told you? Oh, this is going to come up on the next slide. Remember what I told you, though, about pruning? You can't think about everything all the time. So you have attention to a certain subpart of things. 
Okay? And I think it's necessary for, for learning entirely new plants. Right? And again, I have papers about this. So if you're wondering why I think this, I just don't have time to do that talk at the same time I do the, the robot ethics talk. I have, though, in, for skeptics in the pub, given two one-hour talks, the, the, <laughs> the consciousness talk and the ethics talk, the two different talks. So anyway, um, language just helps. Okay, language isn't the key thing. Culture accumulates concepts that are likely to help you focus conscious attention on worthwhile things. Some people think that language is key to consciousness. I think other animals are conscious. But again, you already know that I don't think consciousness is, I, I, I don't think that things are necessarily more You know that moral agency is another thing. Okay, so, so let's see. Okay, and this is self-awareness. So self is one of those concepts. So a lot of people think, when are you conscious when you're self-aware? Right? But I think that's not sufficient reductionist because, because awareness is the key thing and self-awareness is another term, okay? So what do we, why would we have that for artificial intelligence? You don't need it all the time. Uh, Google doesn't need it, right? Well, Google doesn't need it to call the web and to, uh, and to figure out what words mean, all right? Um, Watson doesn't need it for that. But if a system is, has a bottleneck, so there's a cognitive resource that's limited, then it needs to focus, all right? So if you've got massive distributed learning, then you don't need this. But if you need to, for example, you need to be in one place at one time, and you can only learn if you're pointing your eyes at something, that's when you need something like this system. Um, so again, consciousness comes out of those tractability things that's talking about before, about computation taking time. It's like you're shining a light on a subset of the thing that you can do. That's Dennett's uh, attentional spotlight. Very um, So. Assuming that you've got a bottleneck, then it makes sense to allocate uh, your, your learning skills to tasks you're currently doing in proportion to how uncertain you are about doing them, all right? So this is just a really good heuristic we've probably evolved for what we direct our, 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 our conscious attention to, right? But we don't know that we're doing that. That's just, it just gets triggered. It's something you're currently doing and you didn't know how to do it. So you can do a lot of things flexibly. Like, I don't know how I choose the words I choose, right? Well, I choose whether to say something. I think I self-censor and say, well, do we have time for this now, right? Okay. Yeah, they're all, uh, it's also used for, um, uh, yeah. You will, you will have your attention grabbed by things that, you, that surprised you, right? Also, things are dangerous. So there's a lot of things that happen. But that's, you know, biology is all you can All of them. Okay, back to the, the um, thing about correlation and non equal causation. In humans, we are only responsible for what we're aware of, right? It makes sense. We can't control anything else. That's what we call control. Now, now <laughs> we do control. If you're, if you're a roboticist, then you are controlling your heart rate and your breathing rate and uh, your aging, right? <laughs> you're controlling all those things. You have metabolic control. But, our language has evolved to talk about responsibility and control only of that subset of things that our consciousness attends to. All right? But why do we have consciousness? Again, because of this cognitive constraint. All right? Awareness itself isn't what's magic, all right? But it is the basis of our intentional communication. Again, definitionally so. I know this stuff is weird because all of a sudden things are collapsing down into small terms, but um, it's, it's it's, it's cool when you understand it. The philosophy of language is cool. <laughs> the, uh, so that's what intentional means, all right? In fact, I think we didn't have a definition. So unawareness, okay, it's not a definition for it, but it is a form of proving. Right? There's a whole lot of stuff you don't have to worry about. You don't need your conscious attention. But awareness is a subpart of intelligence that helps you learn quickly, essentially. That's a shortcut for that. Um, intentional is actions we are aware of, all right? And, and there's, you can find lots of debates and interesting literature about whether sometimes you become aware of them after you've already made them. But we still call those intentional. All right. And now, I promise to find soul. <laughs> soul is the supposed property for making you a moral patient. Okay? So it's a hypothesized thing. Like, the, like I don't know if you know the history of light. Um, they figured out that light was a wave. It acts like a wave. But it went through a vacuum. 
So, well, how does that work? Well, there must be something in the vacuum. vacuum. What is it? The ether. What is the ether? It's the stuff that waves. Okay. So I, I think of the soul kind of like that. It's something we've hypothesized that there's something there. And I know there's a lot more to it. I don't need to piss off any piece of theologian. But, but I'm just going to, within the context of this talk, use it to say we, there's something that we consider to make something a moral patient. I think it's about, about being a member of human society. Right? I think that's the thing that, that gets our agency. Um, and so then the question is, what can we position our society such that robots don't need that kind of um, support? Even if a robot was your best friend, if its mind was constantly backed up onto the, uh, onto the internet, right, by Wi-Fi, and its body was uh, mass produced, then you wouldn't have to say it. Right? You wouldn't have to worry about it in terms of, uh, you know, like if there was a fire, do you save it or the kid? The kid, right? Because the kid you can't reproduce. But the robot, you can. Right? So that's, that's the kind of trying to take these pieces apart and say that consciousness is just part of how we use our intelligence. It's how our intelligence evolved. Right? And it's important. It's amazing. It's cool. But it's not magic. And it's not just the consciousness that makes us moral patients. It's ethics comes out of society, and it's about our role within our social structure. Right? Okay. Again, a reminder that most of the stuff in that last part was out of my own research, and it's not as universally picked up. Although, again, if you go read those papers, you know, they cite, there's other people that think similarly. But it, that you can tell that was more controversial. I've now defined, I actually did define self-aware. I forgot to define suffering autonomous, but well, if you want, ask in Q&A. Um, let's talk about AI in society. I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Is does not imply ought, all right? But a AI ethics systems relate two types of human artifact, ethical systems and social systems. It's normative, not descriptive ethics, right? There's no predetermined slot for AI to discover. So the question is the utility of displaced responsibility, okay? It's not a question that is possible. People already feel ethical obligations towards robots, right? It's easy to, to, uh, to imagine that being legislated, right? It's somebody who thinks it's a good idea for women votes or something, all right? So personally, the things I most want in the future are sustainability, lack of suffering, and conflict, right? Um, so that implies uh, better regulation. Oh, this, uh-oh. All right, so the, these slides look a little old to me, so I'm, I, I think I may have to wing the very last bit. Um, anyway, uh, better regulation of, of our resource exploitation, um, and artificial intelligence can, can potentially help us with this. All right. Um, and, but this already says, I said regulation, governance can help us with this. And generally, intelligence, and that's why I, I, I had this and I deleted it, because um, all intelligence can potentially help us with this. But also, as we get more intelligent, and as we communicate more, I'm worried that that, right, that same regulation could actually reduce individual variation. And I don't think that I'm afraid of that only because I personally am eccentric. Um, I, again, when we talk about laws of, of computation and laws of uh, biology, one of the laws of biology, it's known as the fundamental theorem of evolution, is that um, the faster you can change, the faster you evolve, is it's directly determined by how much variation is there in your society. So as you get, as you get, as, if, you, if you feel like you're, you're in an optimum, if you're doing really well, you should reduce the variation. But actually, as I just told you, everything is changing faster and faster. Because we've got all these agile things on the planet, right? Because of, we have all this free behavior. So it's important to maintain variation um, in order for us to, to deal with the changing planet. So, um, Oh, yes, here we go, sorry. <laughs> sorry, there was a slide left in. Okay, so yeah. The intelligence uh, increases the chance of both of these, all right? And this is one, I don't, have, how many people here have heard about the free range kid thing, controversy? Yeah, there's this whole thing that people weren't even watching. I certainly was, I don't have kids. I have two pictures of kids, those are most of my grad students' kids. <laughs> yeah, um, but I had not noticed that how you get raised now is completely different than how you got raised when I was being raised, right? And did you see this? Like in 1979, 
there, you know, somebody just found some like thing from women's magazine or something that said, like, is your kid ready for preschool? And most of the cognitive skills, like, you know, how many numbers can they count up to? People would laugh at now because the kids are like everybody's focusing so much at pre-training their kids. But then one of the things was, can they find a way home when they're eight blocks away in any direction from your house? <laughs> and all these parents are like, what? I would never let my kids one aisle away from me in the grocery store, let alone eight blocks away from me at night. You know. And um, one of the people studying this actually had, he had been working in the 70s on, uh, on uh, navigation, on, on how you develop, yeah, it was just basic developmental psychology. When do you learn to navigate? Interesting question, very related to consciousness and navigation. But um, he noticed all this stuff was changing, something brought him back to it. And he had actually filmed kids running around and finding, you know, building little spaces for themselves down by the river that their parents didn't even know about. There was like an entire community that the kids would go to and they'd ride their bikes and whatever. Um, and, and, he, and he had all these papers about like, you know, when they get the bicycle that massively increases their range, blah, blah, blah. So he went back and found those kids. To the a lot of them hadn't moved away very far, and he and they, like the rest of America, were, were like monitoring their kids, you know, on a on a two foot leash. And he said to them, "Well, what about you know?" He showed them the film, and, and some of the people even said, "I thought those were dreams. I couldn't believe that I was allowed to do that stuff. So I thought I must have just dreamed all that." So people, even in this generation, have lost contact with their older selves, right? <laughs> because. Society has brought them along on this thing about you're responsible that nothing happens to your kid and, and that your kid doesn't do anything to anyone else, right? So this is a massive shift. So these are both things that that uh, that, that you know could happen. So my recommendations I've, I've got two. Uh, this really came from the previous one. Don't make robots or AI unnecessarily humanoid. I don't think we need to make this suffer. I think we should be the principal agents. Um, I think that uh, doing that increases the chance we allocate researchers' responsibility to, uh, to improve the work. Um, I also think, now this sounds a little weird, but it, it relates to what I just explained to you, we need to treat our personal data like our homes, okay? So when we give out information, and I don't think we go back on having information out there. In fact, if quantum computing works or something like that, no encryption anymore, right? So a lot of say, oh, we have good hygiene, you know, forget it. Machine learning, uh, you can build models, and the more, the better model you build, the least, the less data you need about any particular person to predict what they're going to do. All right. So I don't think we can go back, but I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, like, think about your house. Okay. Probably half the people in this room, maybe all of us, could break into your house. Okay. Certainly the police could get in your house. Certainly the army could get into your house. But if you found anyone in your house. You would expect them to go to jail. Now we know that sometimes it doesn't happen. We don't do it right now. But basically, we we regulate our society to say, and that you know that was what I was from the beginning. Way back at the very beginning, it was like, well, how do we make sure that you know that nobody kill, kills our kids or whatever, right? It's always been about policing, and I think we're just going to police in this too. So these are the two immediate recommendations I have about AI and robot ethics. I, I guess I've done more towards AI and less towards robots. Well, that's because of this. <laughs> but that's it. I, I just want to remind you again that AI already owns our advantages. It does exist. And so there's a utopian thing, which is that, that we'll all figure out how to solve our, our hard problems, you know, like sustainability. Maybe we'll figure out fast satellite travel or how to unbend the universe so it doesn't go to heat death. Right? Who knows when you have amazing machines that we've never had before for, for thinking? Um, but the dystopia is losing autonomy and ability to freely express or catastrophic disruption of the global ecosystem, which is what we've been doing with our intelligence so far. Right? And again, I didn't show in this talk, but I probably have a slide somewhere if you want them, about about the uh, you know, the the uh, the proportion of the ecosystem that's become sort of seven species because they're our favorite seven species. It's unbelievable how we've taken over the planet at, at an increasing rate. And it's not just about human population, it's about just dominance. So these are the two things that AI can do for us. Um, and I hope that we <laughs> so impossible not to pick those two guys. <laughs> yeah. I see this a lot. And I still can't stick on them. So All right. So yeah. Um, yeah, I don't remember why I slept through that slide except it's beautiful. <laughs>
I know people want this, but I don't think it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah, I want to thank my students, including the two that graduated recently, and my collaborators. Thanks. So I guess the two questions are, will people agree with you that we should make a cube, uh, robot a humanoid? And secondly, can we stop it? Because maybe it'll happen accidentally because uh, we're making computers have better vision, we're making computers learn how to learn, and we may discover that uh, they are much more human than we sort of intended and they jump jumps ahead. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, Stuart Russell recently having constructed the uh, Center for Existential Risk at, uh, Cambridge. Cambridge, yes. Yep. Uh, uh, specifically, is talking about um, what the people who did chemical weapons did. So the scientists actually said, okay, this this is going nowhere good. And they just sort of stopped working on it. Yep. And if you go look at the Wikipedia page, it doesn't tell you that. It tells you about which politicians you know, shut it down. Nixon was one of the ones who shut it down. He did something useful, right? Yep. <laughs> right? But, 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 okay, so politicians are better at getting their names in history than from scientists, but scientists have been apparently the first steps and said, okay, we don't want to do this. Um, so you're not asking to shut down the artificial intelligence no. program, or even artificial general intelligence, you're just saying, let's say, stop putting some features in. I, I have to say something about artificial general intelligence, so uh, sorry if I, I offend anybody here. Um, I think it's a pejorative term. Yeah. Basically, the, um, People have been trying to solve the whole problem of AI since the beginning of AI. And a bunch of people sort of 10 years ago decided that, that the other people hadn't solved the problem yet because, um, because they weren't trying hard enough or they were trying to do their own thing. It's not true. There's been, you can go through the entire history of AI you know, back, back I don't know, probably centuries. People have always tried to build human life intelligence. Um, the, but a lot of them want it to be this beautiful magic single algorithm too. It's the same thing with the consciousness researchers. They're looking for this beautiful magic pattern in the brain that suddenly makes you ethically blind or something, right? Again, I think that's a flaw in reasoning. It's not about, consciousness is not the same as a soul. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, I, I just want to just digress too far. No, no, you, but <laughs> you, you, you said, uh, you're not trying to stop artificial right. intelligence research. There are certain things that you hope yeah. in the community will agree we don't sh we shouldn't go there and we'll stop it right. because there exactly. are drawbacks. And it doesn't have to be the community. Although, uh, again, hey, I think that's slides about this. Um, it doesn't have to be the community, but the, the UK is actually, I, I, you know, there, there's always all these uh, ridiculous nationalist things that. Uh, let's see if I There but but actually, the the, uh, the oldest AI society in the world is Artificial Intelligence Society of Behavior, uh, and the Simulation of Behavior, which started in the UK. And there's a lot of people here who, who were very invested in making human-like uh, robots. And yet, they brought a bunch of us together in 2010, um, to, in like November of 2010, uh, to talk about, uh, they were worried. The EPSRC is the, the government's funding council for AI and robotics, okay, for doing research in this. And they were worried, basically, that robotics was essential to British competitiveness, but that something like what happened to GM food might happen to robotics. So they brought a bunch of experts together to say, I think, really, just to say, oh, look, oh, we, we care about ethics. <laughs> but the experts who've given up three days of our time, which is hard, it's hard to find time, uh, wanted to do something. And so we produced <laughs> the principles of robotics, which EPSRC signed up to and published on their web page in, in 2011, on April 2011. So I, I encourage you to have a look at this. But again, this is from a bunch of people who are the kinds of people that would normally, just by gut, of course, want to make their robots into children. <coughs> and they said, robots are meant for schools. OK, this is, a, this is actually the first three are Asimov's laws corrected. OK? So remember. This is, they, they obviously people wanted to make it so you can't kill it all, but this is the UK. What are you, like fifth, sixth, we, I'm sorry. We, we, I, I just have a passport too. Um, <laughs> but we're like the fifth or sixth largest weapons producer in the world, so we can't say that there's not, they're not going to kill it. Um, so, that, that's a, okay, they'll only kill for national security, right? Um, so that, that's the compromise that happens. But anyway, humans, not robots, are the responsible agents. Okay. Robots should be designed and operated as far as practical to comply with existing laws and fundamental rights and freedoms, including privacy. 
And there's a huge concern about having robots in the house and who's going to tell them what. We were all worried about uh, Cynthia Brizio's new thing where she shows this little kid, you know, this little kid talking under her, her uh, blanket with her robot. It's like, oh yeah, we really want that going through the internet, right? The footage of whatever she's sitting in the blanket. But the, um, but actually, I heard about this Barbie. Mattel has decided that Barbie should talk with your kid and upload the information into the cloud. And then when she comes home from school the next day, say, uh, oh, so how did the exam go, right? <laughs> Yes. If robots are in the home, people will think of them as being like dogs, and dogs don't tell your secrets. Robots, unless we get amazing things like Harvey and Christian that we talked about before, would, would probably be sugar too. Hey, you know, we know about Snowden. Thank goodness for Snowden. <laughs> a lot of us saw that was a problem. A lot of us saw that the government was going after the, the big search engines in the late 90s. But it took something like that to really So you're saying it. that the Barbie manufacturers and similar <coughs> Uh, robot manufacturers should not uh, uh, put this information into the cloud anywhere. About if you put this kind of thing into the cloud to store it, you need to encrypt it and you need to anonymize it. And this is something people can say about Google since it was founded. <coughs> you don't need to keep that information tied to the individual user for more than a few months. Right? So, so there's things that you can do, but anyway, robots are products. They should be designed using processes which is sure the safety and security of GitX replacing the third law of robotics. <laughs> This is all on the web. You can just Google it. And has, have these been adopted since then? Well, adapted. So these are on the web. Yeah. <laughs> but they were basically getting ignored, as I said. But um, now, uh, one of the people there, Alan Winfield, got onto the ISO. There's a committee trying to put together robot ethics as an ISO standard. So again, that, that just makes it something that's recommended for good practice. The only country that has it actually law. We're, the, we're one of the only two countries that has anything, and this is sort of like a policy document on a web page. The, the other one is South Korea. And you can understand why South Korea would really care, because there's a bunch of militarized robots in the, in the DMZ the, between North and South Korea. So those are the only two countries so far that have this policy. But, um, but yeah, quickly, robots are manufactured artifacts, again, calling them that they should not be designed in a deceptive way to exploit vulnerable users. Instead, their machine nature should be transparent. This is what people get the most angry about. Um, they want to fool people into liking their robots. And they, and they say, we have to do this because otherwise they, they can't provide the full benefit of a new relationship. OK, that's, that's the trade off. And finally, and this is, this is a huge thing for drones, I can't believe this hasn't become a lot yet. But there's no reason a robot shouldn't be treated exactly like a car. If it crashes into your building, you should go read the license plate. Okay? So it's just inconceivable that this, is, this hasn't been treated the same way. Um, and I think it will eventually. The whole thing when you do stuff like this is you're trying to accelerate. You're trying to bring the future you want. Yeah. Let's take some questions from the floor. Right, all kinds of questions. Uh, over there, yes? Uh, can you take the screen back to the first law? Okay, sure. Oops. What happened there? That's interesting. Okay. Yes? Uh, last word on the second sentence. Whose nation? Is this the nation of the first world? This is, as I said, a complete compromise that not everybody is happy about. <laughs> um, and I do think, well, it's an interesting thing. Again, I don't want to uh, like get myself on high or something, but some people think that uh, drone warfare kills less civilians than, than real warfare, like cluster bombing. Um, but I do, as I said, I got involved with this because I am worried that when human soldiers aren't at risk, then there's an increased probability of trying to invade and control countries. So I think, I think your concerns are real, but this was what we could get through the panel, which included representatives of the government and the research councils. There's a secondary to that, and, okay. that, and that is, along the same lines, yeah. uh, I follow your presentation with great interest, and this is the first one in this forum that I've ever been to. Oh, right. <coughs> you seem to be considering uh, how AI will interface with uh, we human beings right. in the first world, not how AI will interface with the third world, and what in your opinion, would be the implications of global security yeah. in that scenario. Right. Notwithstanding the fact that the very fact that we refer to AI as being AI mm -hmm. assumes that we have got our eye, real intelligence. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I think that's a good question. Um, 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 I think
I, I think by the definitions which I said I was going to stick to you for two hours, there's no question that humans are intelligent. Okay? There's no questions that we choose our next action. Right? That we're not rocks falling down the road. Um, but we can go and have a conversation about uh, what you call it, uh, journalism, if you want to later. But I don't do that on stage. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but going to the third world, uh, part of the point I've been trying to make throughout this, and in fact, the very first paper I wrote, remember when I was talking about the, being freaked out by, by you know, smart guys and stuff, by saying that you're obliged to that thing, was called Just an Artifact. The intelligence, artificial intelligence, is not that different. It's helping us search faster. But it's, so it's exaggerating the effects we already have. And so again, just like some of the things I said for my recommendations, there's two sides with the first world, third world. On the one hand, um, the first world, of course, owns all the technology, this is capitalism, this is income inequality. In fact, the first one of these I came to was basic income. I think the basic income debate is really important. To, to, as I, <laughs> the um, whoops, my bad. <laughs> I totally missed that one. Sorry. Um, but I think you would say that the, the benefits that you highlighted would be applicable to worldwide rather than they, they don't just apply to the first world. Well, no, the, the, the point is that they could, but that that's a separate problem. It's a problem of governance that we have anyway. And the other side of that problem is that actually it is also empowering the proletariat, uh, both, in, both domestically and internationally. So we see what's happening in Syria. We can turn our eyes away from it, but we wouldn't know, we used to have heard about it. And if you look at what's happening in terms of extreme poverty, it is massively reduced in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. And some people say that's because of the financial crisis that's actually uh, allowed uh, countries like China to go in and actually just buy things from people instead of just giving it into corrupt uh, organizations. But, um, so, so, but I'd like to think, I hope, that, that the improvements in technology, in fact, some huge portion of the world is able to get at least a mobile phone as part of what's helping at least in some places, people to create egalitarianism. I think they can disparity is another issue, but it's governance, it's not about the AI. Yet? I was wondering, basically, there's, um, at, what, at what point do you call an intelligent uh, prosthetic uh, uh, a moral agent, basically? Because, because that'll be the, the medical trend, right? It'll be the, we'll start reconstructing part of the brain that's not functioning, start taking over more and more, and at some point, then you, you recreate a biological which has more different kind of problems than you're talking about. Yeah, one, one of the things that I've said for a couple of decades now, please, is that the things that people think are problems with AI would actually be problems with, with cloning and genetic modification, creating these new organisms. And, um, and it's not trivial. To, so so the, the it, yeah, I honestly, I, I, again, maybe like the terms I shouldn't really go into it because there is no question that um, there's a lot of people clamoring to become super people. And you get a few people like, what's her name, Susan Greenfield, something, saying, oh, but you just can't go there, right? But she's like, you can't go there with with each other or something. I do not know why that should be. So um, I suspect that. So you would have turned down uh, extra brain cells and extra CPU in the brain at some stage? Well, you know, actually, honestly, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I was reading these articles about that, uh, that I, I personally, you can look at my face, you can see I'm, I'm one of these people that tends to be kind of conservative about biological augmentation, right? But, um, but I, um, when you read about uh, kids, um, like some huge portion of kids at school now, at university now, are, are using uh, drugs to help them focus. And I think, you know, that might be something that would help me be more successful as an academic too. Yeah, so I, I, and we all, we almost all uh, uh, use caffeine, except for the Mormons, you know, so we are already going that direction. Um, I didn't, I didn't use caffeine until, until I moved here. I was about 26, and, and it was, it was impossible to live socially without taking tea. So, <laughs> but, but so I, you can't do what Susan Greenfield says, and shut down that whole conversation, say, let's not go there. We have I don't. I think it's possible, but again, I think we need to realize. I mean, like the um, there are certain things that people don't have in their homes. So this, I, I again go back to weapons of power, right? There are certain things that in some countries are not allowed to have in your house. You're not supposed to have an automated machine gun, right? Yeah. 
that, so that maybe there will also be things that will decide it's too much power in one individual. But um, yeah, I, again, I don't think that because it's AI makes it different. I think it's the kind of thing that society will decide how to regulate. Sure. Um, I really like all your recommendations. Okay. Um, and let's say we, that this is what we have. Do you think? Do you think that at some stage um, the AI robots will turn around and say, "Hold on, we'd like to be part of the discussion of whether we should be agents or not." Right. That will only happen if we build them to have goals such that they could do that. Right. So this. So my my new. Okay. So you said AI robots. Let, let's think about <coughs> your calculator. Your calculator can do, so people, again, this is back to correlation. Intelligence was correlated with consciousness, was correlated with moral agency in humans, and ambition. Not in everybody. Actually, it's like 18, 20% of people have competitive personality types. So, so if, they, if they were super smart, they would use it to their advantage over other people, right? A lot of people are actually cooperatively oriented, and a lot of people just care about themselves, they don't actually care about how other people are doing at all. Right? So, um, but anyway, for some reason, some people, that so maybe there's 18%, think that as soon as you got smarter, you would take over the world. But calculators are already doing math better than us, and they don't take over anything, right? And so the question, and Google, like, not the company, the company is fairly human, right? But the Google stuff that does search, like, that's not going to take over something. And it's, what, it knows way more than we do, right? You know, lots of going to take over something. It's got a human name already, and that's a problem. But it's not... It's, it doesn't have any motivations except for answering questions. That's the only motivation that's built into it. If you allow the system, and now this is what Nick Bostrom, uh, Nick Bostrom has something called the uh, orthogonality thesis or something like that. Anyway, it's about, uh, it's about that the goals are independent of the rest, can be independent of the rest of the action. And that's actually, that was in my PhD in like 2001, that you can take these pieces apart. But, he thinks, well, still, if it's self-learning, even only on the action level, it might, uh, AIs might do some kind of horrible damage to the world, uh, even if they didn't mean to, that even if that wasn't the main, the primary goal that, that you built into it at the top. Um, I actually think that is a problem. We have to be able to figure out how to regulate and attend to, if we allow the systems to self-learn, we, we should restrict where it can self-learn, and if we can see it coming, then we should shut it down, right? And I think that's a problem for our society now. I think our society now, you know, so he, he literally has a paper that's talking about AI turning the world into paper clips, you know, by some accident, right? But we're turning the world into not just paper clips, into humans and cows and dogs, right, and cats. Have, have you seen the, the numbers about the drops in like rodents and, and amphibians and birds in the UK? It's just, you know, because we love cats, right? And we love them outside. It's, it's unbelievable what we're doing to biodiversity. So I think he's totally right, except to say this is a problem of AI. That's not a problem of AI, that's a problem of intelligence. It's just the I. Okay? So we've got that problem and we should be dealing with it now. Question from you? Sorry? I'm not used to it. I guess maybe in 2025 or years ago, I met with Blue Heart and on their project site. Yeah. Um, and they had a vision of um, you know, maybe there's some magical moment where we were going from no AI to the thing everybody called AI. Yeah. You know, the recognizable magic that's hard to get yeah. the screen or something like that. Yeah. Can you identify what you think is the roadblock? He had an idea back then. Yeah. And that was 25 years ago, he didn't get there. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there is a roadblock because I think people over ascribe agency already. Right? People ascribe agency to their to their rabbits, right? You know, to, to, to their, their stuffed animal rabbits, I mean. <laughs> right? Okay. So we they ascribe moral patience to them, right? So I don't believe there's a more there, there are already things passing the Turing test. People are mistaking things, right? I I think it's like um, when we think about the history of like how people define ourselves as different from animals, um, we keep uh, we, we keep moving the, road, the, the, the bar. And I think one of the cool things about AI is as we get used to it, right now we think, oh gosh, it has language, it's rational. It's like us, oh, we're perfectly rational. We have language, right? Once we start getting more experience of it and better understanding of it, it may help us understand the extent to which we are animals and make us worry more about animals, too. So I actually think that maybe this will be a good balance. 
I know this isn't what you want to hear, but you weren't paying attention because I said I don't want that to happen. So it's not the, I, the, the roadblock is me. I, I'm trying to say don't. The, it's the same answer to the question I asked back, the, back there. The, 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 these things can do all the things we can do. The driverless cars. They do, you know, everything, right? They, they move in the real world. They choose paths. They, uh, they navigate. They learn. They respond to each other. They're social. They communicate. Right? You could argue that actually what you've just described is the thing with the picture of the clever legs. No. It was really just a sophisticated expert system and it hadn't really moved on beyond the 25 years ago when I met both. Well, yeah, it's much better. But that's part of the point. The point is that there isn't this magic, there isn't this magic drawing line. It's the, it's the, it's the frog in the, in the bullion pan thing. But, so, but it's not just about AI. Like I said, I'm not worried just about AI. I'm worried about intelligence and culture and what we're already doing to the planet in terms of things that are actually hazard. In, in terms of things that are actually cool. You know, I, there are such cool things happening. Have you seen this stuff about, um, we may, you know, in the next five years, have, you know, babelfish, AI babelfish, right? That we can understand language spoken. And so you would get to go talk to people. And maybe it would be no better than Google Translate, right? You'd have to be intelligent yourself and guess what was really meant, but it would be so wonderful if people weren't all having to speak uh, broken English and, and we didn't have to have a little guilt about having been born speaking English, right? <laughs> so, um, so there's wonderful, wonderful things happening with AI and, and our lives are really fun. And as a, we have fewer infants dying than ever, which is one of the things we know people don't like their babies to die. Not only because we ask them, but when babies die, regimes fall, right? That is one of the most fundamental things that political science has figured out. Right? The state becomes unstable. So all these things we care about, we're, we're achieving, but we're also having some knock-on consequences we haven't always realized. And every so often we screw up and millions of people down. Right? Right. Um, so you, you outlined a set of principles and recommendations there. Yeah. Are you aware of any other field of science where those kinds of voluntary principles have acted as a constraint on the community and, and stopped anyone going into the spaces that you're trying yeah. to prevent them from doing. Yeah, the, the, as I mentioned before, uh, chemical warfare. Um, there, there was also, uh, I don't know if you know about the Nazi experiments that were being done on humans. Now, apparently some people have occasionally used the information that was gathered by the Nazis, and like, for example, in the space programs. But basically that became something not only that you couldn't do anymore, but also that you couldn't even cite, you weren't supposed to read. Um, so that was, I guess, medicine. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's, so <coughs> it isn't just about won't someone want to do this. It's about, you know, we're a society. We have, we have policing and we, we watch out after each other. Remember I was telling you, we didn't let our kids go more than one mile away from us in the grocery store. How, how would we let people do something if we understood that it was damaging to us, right? So I, 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 I understand why people say, oh yeah, and I think it's back to what you were asking about, like, oh, because there might be this, this, this magic critical point which you get to, it's a tipping point. People talk about tipping points that would just all fall down. Um, but intelligence is more complicated than that. And as long as we're staying well away from it, and that's what I was talking about, as long as we regulate and stay well away from, uh, uh, you know, making like, ape-like things, <coughs> then I don't think that's an issue. I, have you read uh, uh, Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, The Cat's Cradle? The, the, the world ends, I didn't think of it ends in a lot of crypto. It's, it's, so by, you by that particular, water it's, oh. it's because basically nanotech. There's something called Ice 9. And it just, yeah. I, that's much more likely than AI. It, it, come on, we program, we know there's bugs and stuff. It, it, it's not just going to happen and, and nobody has a plug to pull. Right? How much monitoring when kind of the activity in AI now is so diverse? There are so many research institutes, individuals, corporations doing this all over the planet. How, how, do, how, we do, weapons? Weapons? Right? how do we monitor nuclear weapons? How do we monitor nuclear weapons? How do we monitor chemical weapons? How do we know that people are? How do we not monitor weapons? anthrax? Well, sometimes people do, and then we, we nail them, right? <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to sound like that. Like, I'm not talking about Iraq. I was talking about the guys that did anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> they found the guy that was sending anthrax and actually committed suicide. But, uh, you know, these things happen. Right? And, and, but that's, we are vigilant, and sometimes we, bad things will happen, but we just keep trying to increase the probability that they don't and that good things happen instead. Quick 
question right at the back beside the camera. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, well, actually, nuclear weapons um, have the benefit that we can detect radioactivity remotely. It's rather difficult to detect AI. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually... No, I, that, that, that wasn't actually my question. That was a, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the, 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 the question was, um, <laughs> how do we deal with AI which can design other AIs? The sort of deep thought um, Douglas Adams, I will design the computer that shall come after me thing. Or for that matter, do, and, and do we allow that? And do we allow AI to debate ethics, learn and debate ethics with us? In, for, in, or because there's a risk that it might actually come up with a better, better argument than you have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, going back to, the, uh, to, to what you said was not a question, it was just an assertion. I wanted to dispute it, and I think it's necessary for actually answering your question. So um, I, I was thinking about this one. Uh, the, the thing, like, how would you know if somebody was using your personal data? Well, actually, AI helps you with that too, because you could say, what is the probability that you would have shown me on Facebook a picture of the thing I just bought on Booking.com if you didn't actually have shared my data, right? What are the ads that that particular ad would have just come up right now? Right? <coughs> we, we've all had that experience, right? So. So I don't think it's that hard to recognize uh, um, when, when AI is being used. And, but I think we need, you know, it's one of those skills we'll have to get good at if we're going to actually police and apply these rules. All right. The second part of your question actually was back, it was pretty much, I pretty much already answered that. I, 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 I'm recommending normatively that, that we do make those rules and we do perceive what's going on. And even though it's not as big as radiation, um, and, and this would be a big challenge to the courts. The courts right now do not like it when you use Bayesian, <laughs> when you use Bayesian evidence, right? They think, they think somehow that's too complicated. I don't know why they don't like it. They actually outlawed some, was it a British court? They outlawed the use of Bayesian uh, reasoning in court. And it's the best way to know what, what the causality is, <laughs> is, is Bayesian reasoning. We're going to have to get over that, and we'd have to say, yeah, Courts of law that was admissible evidence that something was incredibly improbable. And we do that in gene, gene testing, right? We say, oh, you know, the, the people that threw a rock and then they find their cousin and they say, oh, the DNA is this related, and so that's evidence that the person who threw the rock was that person on the bridge, right? So we do have that already in gene genetic stuff, but we don't, but, but DNA evidence, it's going to come out more. It's going to have to come out more. Some of these AI researchers may be sneakier than Facebook. And Facebook's a bit sneaky, but it's not very sneaky. It's quite obvious that they're sharing data. Some of the others may realize that they got, that uh, if yeah. the research was well known, they might be shut down. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there is an argument that the, in the end, the AI will, will try and prevent its true level of intelligence being known. Okay. But that's not this. This is that the AI researchers yeah. will deliberately <coughs> keep their research hidden and then maybe too late, and they'll be doing exactly what you've asked Going them. back to my, to my thesis, I don't care whether it's the AI researchers themselves or the AI. Yeah. Right? I've, I've recommended that we don't make the AI uh, have goals and plans like that and not, not allow that through. But, but whichever organizational principle looks like it's trying to go that direction, that's what I was just talking about. If the better the models we have, the more we can predict and assess what, what the probability of things happening are. Yeah. So I think we can detect intelligence events, just like we can detect, you know, like, uh, you know, earthquake events and things like that. At the back, yes. You, you had your hand up for one, yes, please. Uh, yes. In, uh, <coughs> In, in Norway, we, uh, we solved the problem of cars having responsibility uh, uh, a, a little bit different than you do here. And, and the reason is that there are some cases where, uh, let's say, a brake fails in a car and it rolls over a person and damage is inflicted. So it's not the person's fault. Uh, and, it's, uh, and then you have what's called objective responsibility. And that means whatever damage the car does, uh, the car is responsible for, and you have to have insurance for that. So, uh, and, and my question is this: um, Would it be impractical? Could it uh, could it be impractical uh, to levy the responsibility to the owner or the maker of the robot for any damages that ensues, because that would leave uh, a lot of damage <laughs> without any fault? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me ask a question, sorry, just technically back into the Norwegian legal system, which I don't know much about. But I did live in Denmark, but I don't know the, uh, the, um, 
When you say ob that the object is the thing that has responsibility, does that indicate that the manufacturer is not the one? So it's not manufacturer's liability, it really is the object that is liable? It, it means that whatever damage the object causes is covered by the insurance that is mandated. Okay. All right. So, okay. But maybe that's not quite as alien as I thought it was, but, but it's interestingly phrased. Okay. So, the, the, um, because normally when we talk about uh, liability for, for machines failing, there's two people that could be to blame. Um, uh, well, I guess there's, there's three. There's um, the operator, right? The, the, the owner-operator is, is usually to blame. But once in a while, if you get enough evidence again, gathering evidence, you could say that the manufacturer has done something correct. And then there's liability to the manufacturer. You can go back and have class action lawsuits and get that in calls and all those kinds of things. There are also things that are called just acts of God, which, say, which basically means well, you can't do anything about that. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, countries handle that in various ways. It's interesting in a way. That was why I was, because what, the way you first described that, I thought basically that the, the manufacturers must have a lot of power in the government because they pushed their liability to the owner when it really sounded like it was <laughs> the manufacturer's fault. But I think I think what you're talking about may it makes sense. You're just saying there's something that can happen, and that's how society that society has decided to organize itself to to fund um, <coughs> to, to fund um, the you know, who gets paid. Who gets paid. No, but the question is not who gets paid, but it's uh, who does the thing. No, no it, it's not about liability. If if uh, if nobody's responsible, yeah. uh, uh, then then you sort of have this you have this vacuum of moral uh, agency. Right. So you have to give the robot some agency. No, no. You, so you have to have some kind of default, and that's what I'm saying. For your society, apparently, the default is that the owner has to help buy object of insurance. It's not the, it's not the government that buys the object of insurance, is it? Uh, no. No, it's the owner that's had to buy the object insurance, right? So basically, you've taken a class of problems and made them the owners. <laughs> okay, right? yeah. and, and that's why I said it sounds like you're very strong corporations in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, that, and this is exactly the, one of the reasons that I, I push on this, is because governments and, and companies are going to want the object to be, to be responsible so that they don't have to pay for things, and they don't have to take the responsibility. And so who winds up paying for things? So it becomes an act of God or an act of machine. I don't care. The point is that society has to accept that. that my, I, I come from Chicago, and there's a very high tall building. It used to be called the Sears Tower. Um, and the windows broke. And it was like you know, 110 stories. And this huge chunks of glass came down. Amazingly, nobody was killed. But it was a very windy day, and, um, and there was a new building being built nearby. And the wind rippled the glass, and, uh, and it smashed a lot of cars. Really, you know, huge amount of damage. And the government determined, rather than deciding it was the fault of the, how the building had been built in the first place or how the other building was being built next to it, that it was an act of God. And that meant all the people whose cars were destroyed, they had to pay for themselves. Unless they happened to have insurance that covered acts of God, which you can't do that. That sounds like a fascinating example. Some of the things we're doing in the future may be because somebody's creating a second tower close to a first tower in some yeah. kind of sense. Which and who could have suddenly these AIs, which uh, themselves were, were benign, interact in a way which, uh, which oh my goodness, there's a terrible act of God there. Well, but that's, yeah, I, I still think you could say, you, yes, but that's no different than it is for society yeah. now. Right. So lots and lots of times. Let's try and get on a few more. Tim? Um, I'd like to start by saying I found your analyses very, very persuasive. So what I'm about to say is not a criticism of it, it's just a thought experiment. Okay. It's really about human evolution, about our, our human nature and a relationship to new creatures, if you like. Uh -huh. Because it could be argued that the, the, our, our ape-like development, our, our, our evolution, has been a matter of competition, of relationships between yes. people, constant, constant change. <laughs> And you made a very, very good point. I thought about variation and eccentricity, yeah. vitally important. Um, it could be argued that uh, if we were to create creatures like ourselves, we would want to create them in order that they should compete with us, that they should learn, you know, that they should have within themselves the capability to have a moral argument with you, to love, to feel, to suffer. Um, uh, if only because that <coughs> might help us evolve. So it's a theoretical, it's a hypothetical, but you yeah. see where I'm reaching. I'm, I'm reaching yeah. to a counter-argument 
that says, well, actually, the danger in what, in what you're saying is that we have created a set of tools. Uh, we treat them as tools. We treat them as things, objects. Uh, we don't have to worry about any ethical aspects, really, because they're tools. But actually, we've disadvantaged ourselves. Yeah. That's okay. In the so, long run. I'm talking about the long, long run. I think, I think that's really interesting, and I will go ahead and just have the conversation. The, um, the, uh, and I haven't heard quite that argument before, so that's, that's an, uh, it, there's, there, yeah, but usually I just say well, it's a better way to, you know, evolution is the best way to design, so if we want good robots, we should let them compete mm. like we do. Um, and then you get all these things, then you get suffering and, and competing and everything, and you have to have the goal orientations like humans. But anyway, that's a, that's a cool new uh, twist on you. We need to evolve our AI argument. Um, the, uh, so this is one of those things that's normative and there's no good answer for it. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you're going to accept that, and you have to accept the possibility, in fact, uh, the probability, well, you would expect machines to think faster than us. I still don't know about the having the faster body, the more, more adapt, uh, uh, robust bodies. And biology is just amazing. So I don't know if you would get there except by acting biology uh, rather than actually building machines. But because I, I was but actually, just to elaborate on that, I was thinking of convergences, speciations, yeah. all the risks of that. But it's an existential yeah. risk argument. I appreciate that. Well, yeah. And that, so the point is that, um, so I have thought about this too. And the reason that my, my normative recommendations are along these lines still is that I'm not sure that any of the things that we currently hold to value makes sense without the, the emotional and effective experience that humans have. And I don't think we could build something that would that be sufficiently similar to us in terms of our perception um, and, and the way the brain is going to work and things like that, that they would share those. So if you say that there's a subset of values that are more important, like, you know, finding out about math or something, you know, like, or, 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 or competing even better and going out and trying to stop this thing about the, the universe uh, uh, going to heat death. If you say those things are more important, then I think it's worth the risk. But I just think that in the near term, it's and may, yeah, maybe if AI, you know, in 40 years from now, I'll say, you know what, I used to think what I said today, but now I am so blown away by the progress of AI that I now think that is the future. That is the logical future, and we should just give up our planet and for, for, for creating AI because it's making something that's more beautiful than we can ever create. But right now, I think all those people that are that are saying those things and playing those games are actually like weapons men. It's, it's actually a, a form of corruption of, of human values and playing on human emotions. And so right now, um, I, this is the line I'm taking, and, and I don't see evidence that, that AI could go off and do that better than us. So. Oh, yes. Another twist on the topic. Uh, basically, your position is Robots don't really need consciousness in the majority of cases, so if they don't need it, then we don't build it, <coughs> problem sorted. Now, philosophically, there are many uh, property dualism theories which say that consciousness is an emergent phenomena that just appears in itself, providing the system is sufficiently complex. So, what if the same happens here? And if AI is sufficiently complex, it can develop in itself consciousness-like properties, and then the end outcome could be quite unpredictable, including um, something which may actually be akin to self-preservation instinct and so on, with you know well-known consequences. Okay, <laughs> if those guys are right um, about consciousness just being a special form of complexity, so first of all, don't forget that I said I don't, I don't. Yeah, there's, there's two things. Don't forget that I said that I don't, consciousness is not the same as moral agency. And it's just, it's just a way of, of, uh, of, of learning, basically, and, and, and of choosing actions. And secondly, um, let's see, oh, I don't, I, I digress. Okay, it doesn't matter. I'll come back to it. Oh, you said that I said that robots aren't conscious. Actually, no. If you get the whole hour version of my consciousness talk, I, I point out like a bunch of existing AI systems that have to be conscious. Again, just to make my point that it's not a big deal. So robots, if they are trying to learn, uh, and they are in one place. So, so AI in general, like Google doesn't need consciousness that much. Although Google exploits consciousness. If you're really a philosopher, you can think about it. So humans are the, con are the conscious action selection for Google. 
They give us ten, their 10 best guesses of what a good result is. We click one. They record that. So they update, they, they update their knowledge base on a, as a consequence of a conscious person uh, choosing in there. So you can think of the entire system as, as conscious. But you can also point at existing robots that, that learn from their experiences. And I don't care if I call it conscious, because I don't think consciousness is magic in all agency. But I also, you know, Again, I'm just going to read the paper. I, looking at the neuroscience and the, and the psychology literature, I just don't buy this like magic pattern model of consciousness at all. I think it's a specific system. It's evolved for a specific purpose. That we pretty much know which part it's not. The what was the thing that uh, 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 the guy? Neil Bond. No, no, it's not the <laughs> No, no, the guy. The guy who thinks that it's about information oh, yeah, I see. The, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I don't buy that at all. Uh, I, I, I think it's you know, much more of a hippocampal system and episodic memory is involved with it and, and, and uh, as I said, navigation and things like that. But um, yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, Tanani, Tanani is his name. He has, he, everybody wants this from consciousness now. They want, oh, consciousness, I have a theory of consciousness. It's, it's this magic uh, mathematical property that we can get into anything. And the best thing about my theory of consciousness is that there's an explanation, but we can't test it for 40 years because it, it'll be too hard. Perfect. It pushes it out into the future. We can all say, oh yes, there's a magic solution. It's for all. You know, I, I don't. I don't. People, but smarter mathematicians than I have taken the mathematics apart and shown how inconsistent it is. But it can't just be information fusion. Tenori, is that because? Yeah, Tenori. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do? Yeah. Do you think um, it's going to be advantageous for these things to have uh, emotions or just be saying? Yeah, I think emotions are very useful uh, because uh, so some things that you think uh, let's see. some things you're born with and you're involved with. We've talked about these goals, the relationships, the competition, those kinds of things, right? Um, some things are, are extremely transient, like recognizing the words I'm saying right now. You don't need to remember the details of the phone now that you did then, right? But there's some things that you just want to organize. There's a problem in action. It's not just action selection, it's performance of action. It's called dithering. Uh, you don't want to just kind of, if, if you start a whole bunch of things and you don't finish them, you never get to the end, like, like that it's something. So, <laughs> so the uh, emotions are a, a useful way to organize behavior. And that's why I think you can see, if you're, if you're happy to call things like excitation, depression, emotions, then they were the first action selection. Before there was even neurons, there were neurotransmitters, the same neurotransmitters we now have for controlling excitation and inhibition, which is basically now is a good time to act, now is a good time to rest. Right? Um, so why do we still have the very first system that like, you know, I almost with five or ten cells used? It's useful. It, it, you know, there's a bunch of things where you don't actually need to remember it, it's just a you need to remember it in the short term, but not in the long term. So right now I'm happy, right now I'm afraid I'm going to keep running, and then I can go back and reassess the situation, right? So uh, I think they're useful. Again, I don't think they're magic. It's a bunch of slides I didn't put in. <laughs> so there's a lot of hands. We are out of time. Uh -oh. So I propose Sorry. not to take more questions, but I will take a, a few comments, and then those of us who want to continue the discussion afterwards can feed these comments into the general discussion. So a few, I mean, there's one here. Uh, well, so you're not going to be able to answer, but yeah, yeah. except at the end, I'll give you a moment to sum up. Yeah. I'll, like, I've got things. <laughs> so I'll, I'll absolutely forget if we do this. I, I don't know. One thing we've been talking about very much is artificial intelligence, but we've been sort of mixing in artificial motivation, and it's almost this, we're worrying about motiva artificial motivation, but artificial intelligence, and we seem to be sort of conflicting two issues. Right. So motivation versus intelligence. Uh, what concerns me that maybe as we build more and more, create more and more advanced artificial intelligence, we will create a very intelligent elite, but we will actually dumb down the rest of the society by killing creativity because they will just use too much technology. Okay, so just as we don't let our children run around anymore, most people won't even uh, have the chance to learn about uh, creativity. Uh, ben? Um, Going back to uh, the discussion about nuclear weapons and how we uh, how we can track their progress in, uh, of being created, um, w when we're talking about an intelligence, then would it not be possible to then try and try and uh, create a policy that uh, governments set themselves up to that can uh, uh, create like what, what they call the break the breakout time, so the time that uh, that people could start working on it and give them a specific amount of time, which they'll be able to actually create something. 
Uh, down here? Um, about your first recommendation, I, find, I think one of the things from my perspective is around communication, the role of communication of uh, AI activity. And I wonder if it doesn't actually lead to promoting some of those goals that you say that you should try to avoid in terms of interacting in the real world through senses such as vision, scent, interacting with other agents, i.e. humans, and you end up creating a more and more humanoid side so, Sorry, what, what is it that I do that? The need to be uh, more effective in communication, to create optimal right. communications with methods that you actually, and interactions with the real world. I mean, you're not going to be able to have a chance of answering all these questions properly. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 you're doing all right, uh, Martin. Uh, it was a similar question. I was wondering about uh, are there any examples you know of of uh, AI which is too humanoid? Are there already examples of AI yeah, that is too humanoid? Uh, Janina, um, I was going to ask you a question, but I'll turn it into a comment um, on the regulatory recommendations that you're making. I don't see much of a chance of them actually working in a sensible way simply because they are as likely to over-regulate things and therefore stifle um, certain innovation. But on the other hand, even if they don't do that, the military themselves, for example, governments themselves, for national security or any other reason that you said was invoked in the, on those five proposals, are likely to develop those things, humanoids, um, type intelligences. They're the ones who are likely to actually develop it more so than in the in, in the private sector. Um, I was going to ask you what you thought that, but we can talk about it later. That's my view. Okay. Okay. Heather, did you have a question? I don't have a specific question. There are a number of things that I'd be interested to discuss, but... Um Right. So, so, so I think I think we should uh, take these. Yes. Okay. Really quickly, uh, artificial intelligence versus artificial motivation. I do think motivation is part of intelligence, but you're right, it's a discrete part. And I did try to talk about that before when I was talking about the orthogonality uh, issue. So, um, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Good good language about it. The intelligent elite. Um, yes, it's an issue. It's exactly the same issue as what we've got right now. When we had the third world discussion, I was trying to have that conversation too. So it is an issue, and I think we need to try to share information. And there's a lot of people working on that right now. That's what the open access movement is about and things like that. So it is an issue, but it's something. It's not special to AI. It's just, again, we need to regulate. It's the same as the income disparity and things. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I can't read my own handwriting. It's terrible, actually. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, the, 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 the um, calculating the breakout time. Um, I think things are moving too fast, and it's too hard to tell what's going to be hard and what's going to be easy. So I don't think we can easily predict what, you know, like what they're trying to do with Iran about when, they, when, you know, when will Iran have AI. You know? Actually, yeah, Iran has great AI. Um, they, they do it a lot for robot rescue for other earthquakes. But anyway, um, uh, I don't think we can do that. I think we have to just monitor for use and censor it like we, have, we are doing with the chemical weapons. Um, I, I, that would be my, my best guess. Uh, effective communication requires a human eye. Yes, that was why that transparency thing was so, so uh, uh, controversial. But as I said, with all regulation, I mean, really we're having a discussion about ethics and about governance here. Political science is really important. Philosophy is really important. <coughs> we should be spending money on the humanities. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, the um, you have to make that trade off, and you have to decide: is it worth sacrificing this to get that? But, and, and, and if, you, if maybe someone will get smart and figure out a way to have both. I do think that what is currently too humanized and confused people will not get to be in 20 years. Because as we get more experience with AI, and my, 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 my explanation for that, or my example for that, is that when the original King Kong came out, people were apparently screaming and fainting in whatever, in the movie theater. They were terrified. And now it's on afternoon television, right? You know, little kids see it, and they don't think, oh, the girl's going to kill me, right? But, so I think we get more sophisticated. We learn about technology, and it, and it penetrates our culture entirely. So I think in 20 or 30 years, we could increase the level of communication, the level of human likeness and, and benefit the communication. But right now, I think we should avoid that, because people are being very naive, and we need to have meetings like this. Um, and what was the other one? The, oh, the regulations next step were exactly the same answer I just gave about the trade-offs. Um, it, it, regulating is hard, government is hard. 
I already said that, so I should have read those people. Okay. Right, so I'll say thank you in a minute. Just a couple of announcements before we do that. There are, I mean, this, this conversation clearly needs to continue. Uh, it started a few years ago, perhaps, with that 2011 uh, paper. Uh, and it's going, it's been going back a long time, of course, but it's, uh, 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 that was an attempt to push it into the public domain, and let's, uh, let's continue that. Yeah. There are other discussions, of course, about the future of technology. In five weeks' time in this building, rather than the future of robotic ethics, is a talk on the future of biopolitics and what should we do about some of the biological powers that are coming into so our important. hands. Hmm? Yeah. Very, very so, important. And uh, the, we have a professor and a lawyer uh, from Italy called Stefano Vai, who's going to come. And he's probably going to be a little bit more uh, Calls himself Promethean, so I mean, he's going to basically say we should grab, we should grab the fire from the gods, and we we, we should uh, take advantage of this to improve our reproductive capabilities, to improve our intelligence, <coughs> to improve our longevity. But uh, and it's not going to happen if we just leave it up to governments to dilly and dally. But I mean, that's kind of the thrust he's going to probably make, and it'll be a fascinating discussion, I think. Two weeks after that, we're going to look at the future of blockchain. Blockchain isn't so well known, but blockchain is a technology that underpins uh, Bitcoin, and it might give us a whole lot of new possibilities. To doing a decentralized uh, relationships without uh, centralized mediators. You may say, well, huh, what? Well, the speaker is going to come that time, and Nicky Wiles is going to say, I would might transform a whole lot of finance, which might be good news or bad news. It might be bad news if you're a bank wanting to control everything, and it uh, might be good news to lots of other people. Let's hear, hear, hear what he has to say about that. And then two more weeks after that, uh, I think that takes us to June the 20th, we've got a meeting about the future of business, which is going to look at uh, a number of actual angles on uh, things that will change the business environment more broadly, and this is going to coincide with the launch of another book called The Future of Business. And that time we're going to be ambitious, we're going to have eight speakers, and we're not going to give them an hour each, we're going to give them seven minutes each, and my goodness, that's going to be fun organising it, but we're going to see how we get on that. Uh, also in the future we have the chance uh, to go to the pub in uh, 20 minutes or so, we can wander down the road to the of our arms where we can buttonhole each other about that question which we didn't have time to discuss properly here. And uh, having said all that, I'm really very grateful for Jonna to come to share these thoughts with us. Uh, this discussion is clearly, in a sense, not, by no means at the end, not even at the beginning of the end, but it might be getting towards the end of the beginning, and it might be. <laughs> so thank you very much.